Hello and welcome to the lecture. I'm going to talk about the Victorian future. I'm Professor Ewan Morris. I'm a lecturer at the Department of History and Welsh History. I'm a historian of science and I'm a historian of Victorian culture. And as I said, I'm going to talk about the ways in which the Victorians imagined their future. Um, so let's start by looking at this cartoon. It's one of a series of cartoons, all called, as you can see, The March of Intellect, that were published by the satirist William Heath uh, around about 1828. So, okay, slightly before the Victorians, but close enough for, for, for our purposes. Um, and what you can see here is Heath you know, poking fun at the idea of progress and at the idea of technological progress in particular. So there are all sorts of fantastic machines and ideas all scattered around in the cartoon. Um, you can see a steam-driven horse, um, people cooking by steam, lots of people flying, everything taking place by steam. Um, my favourite, obviously, is the object right in the middle of the picture. Um, Grand Vacuum Tube Company, it says, direct to Bengal. And you'll see a queue of early 19th century ladies and gentlemen waiting to enter the Grand Vacuum Tube. The idea, of course, is that they'll all be sucked by vacuum through the tube, so direct from, direct from London to Bengal, straight out there to govern the empire in a matter of seconds. Um, or if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that people are really in a hurry, are being fired direct by cannon. Lots of flying machines of all sorts scattered around. Um, it's satire, of course. This is a cartoon. Heath is poking fun at the pretensions of, of inventors and people who think they really can do things like this. But obviously satire only works if the things that are being satirised really exist, or things like them really exist. And bizarre as some of these ideas seem, they're not a million miles away from technological ideas that were being thought about during the 1820s and the 1830s. In all sorts of ways, the Victorians invented the idea of progress. The notion that things change, that things aren't just going to be more of the same onwards and onwards. Um, during the early 19th century, Victorian natural philosophers started to argue that the universe wasn't static, that the universe changed through time, that the universe progressed, and that one could understand how, say, the solar system came into being. That's what's being portrayed in the image here. And the notion was that if nature changes, if nature develops, if nature progresses, think of evolution, then so, so should society. That just as nature moved on, society should move on, the society should progress, that things should get better over time. And this idea of progress implies that the future, rather than being you know, more of the same, Maybe a different monarch on the throne, but otherwise everything pretty much as it always has been. The idea of progress implied that the future wouldn't just be a different version of the present. But the future would be something somewhere really different. The future would, if you like, be a different country. And throughout the 19th century, as you can see, as you could see from that image by William Heath, now, the Victorians were fascinated by imagining what that future would look like. The Victorians were fascinated by imagining what their future would be, what they thought. So by the end of the 19th century, there's lots of imagining about you know, what's the year 2000 going to look like, for example. How is the future going to change? What was going to happen to make the future different? The future is going to be driven. The future is going to be created by new technologies. Technology was going to change the world in all sorts of ways. 
And as far as the Victorians were concerned, they thought that they could see that happening around them already. Um, new inventions like the electromagnetic telegraph that was invented you know, right at the beginning of the Victorian period properly. The first patent for an electromagnetic telegraph was taken out by Charles Wheatstone and William Fothergill Cook in 1837. Those sorts of new inventions you know, fueled the notion that the future really would be different, that you would be able to do things in the future that you couldn't do today. The telegraph in particular transformed the ways that people thought about time and the way that, that people thought about space. Um, with the telegraph, all of a sudden, you could transmit information more or less instantaneously. You could send messages more or less in no time. Up until this point, by and large, information, communication can only travel as fast as you can. Um, on foot, by horse, by ship, by coach. Now, information travels at the, at, as, at the speed of the fastest human. Um, with a telegraph, of course, information travels more or less instantaneously. And that opened up a whole new future as far as many Victorians were concerned. And you can see that illustrated in this book of the telegraph. Yeah, you know, this notion that telegraphy and the railways as well, really, you know, would make the whole world you know, a, far, a far smaller place, a more manageable place, a place that could be travelled around and understood far more quickly and efficiently. And that's how Victorians really imagined the future. It was a future that was going to be made out of like, you know, bits and pieces of contemporary material culture. They took new technologies like the telegraph and projected them into the future and imagined you know, what these technologies would do to the future. Um, they went to see these sorts of technologies at places like the Royal Polytechnic, the Royal Polytechnic Institution, which is what's illustrated in this picture here. Uh, the Royal Polytechnic Technic Institution was founded in the 1830s on Regent Street in London. Um, in fact, the bits of the original building are still there on Regent Street. And it was a place where literally Victorians went to see the future today. Um, it was an exhibition of progress and invention. Uh, you paid your shilling at the door, you went in, and what you saw inside the Royal Polytechnic you know, was the latest in science and technology. Um, so you'd see electrical gizmos of all kinds. Uh, you can see there are there are canals there in a big pool. Right at the end, you can see that black object dangling down. That's a diving bell. Um, for an extra penny, you could go in the diving bell and be lowered down to the mod to the, to the bottom of that large large tank at the back. There'd be a deep sea diver knocking around inside the tank. Um, as I said, electrical engines, electrical machines of all kinds. That's why you went to places like that to see. And talking about the future, imagining what the future was, was going to be like, talking about what new inventions, what new electri electrical technologies were going to do in the future. It was, it, was, it was part of the vocabulary of science and invention. Technology is increasingly about making the future come real. Um, you'd see at the Royal Polytechnic Institution displays like this one here. This is Professor Pepper's monster coil. It's a huge, a really huge induction coil, a device for producing sparks. Um, I've got one of these as it happens, and it develops a spark. Ooh, that's about an inch or so long, which does actually mean that there's something like 40 or 50,000 volts going across that space. So it's not a trivial amount of electricity. Uh, Professor Pepper's monster coil, on the other hand, produces a spark that's 29 inches long. That's huge. Um, and you know, it's like artificial lightning being produced in the Royal Polytechnic's lecture theatre. It's, it's a spectacular show. And it's deliberately designed to be spectacular. And it offers visions of the future. The future for the Victorians is going to be made up out of machines like the Monster Coil. And going to places like this, going to the Royal Polytechnic or going to the Adelaide Gallery, 
or more than anything else, going to the Great Exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851, you know, affirms the middle class Victorian faith in material and social progress. It's the kinds of inventions, the kinds of machines, the kinds of spectacles that Victorians see in places like this that are going to transform their futures, they think. And again, we can see that very explicitly in this fantastic cartoon. Uh, this is from Pun Punch's Almanac for 1882. So it's actually published at the end of 1881. In 1881, the, there's just been a, an international ele electrical exhibition in London. And Punch is, again, you know, like William Heath, you know, poking a little bit of fun at the pretensions of electricity. But it's very interesting to see, again, what's being portrayed in this picture. Uh, on that huge chariot in the middle, you can see a huge electrical dynamo, a way of producing electricity. It's generating a huge electric light there in the middle. Um, all the horses have electric lights on their heads. There are electrical fairies of various kinds scooting around. Um, you probably can't read the small print, so to speak. Um, but I can point you to it. You can see those oxen at the back. Um, the caption says that they've been frozen and transported from the Antipodes to be revivified by electricity. Revivified to be slaughtered for meat, of course, but still revivified. Uh, in that basket at the bottom, you have turkey eggs. That have been hatched by electricity. And there in the far right, far left corner, you can see the forces of darkness, you know, the gas lighters and the chimney sweeps, all being you know, brushed away and in, back into the past by the forces of the electrical future, the coming force, Mr. Punch's dream, it says there in the caption. So really, by the end of the 19th century, all sorts of technological possibilities seem to be opening up. All sorts of things seem to be possible in ways that they might not have appeared possible before. The Victorians could imagine a future made up of technologies the same as but different from the te technologies that surrounded them that was going to transform the ways that people could interact with each other. So if speech can be transmitted, the telephone is invented in 1876, so why not vision? I mean, if you can talk to somebody on a telephone, why can't you see somebody far away? Um, and late 19th century Victorian magazines and technical journals as well, as well are full of discussions of this machine, machine that they call the telectroscope. And the telectroscope was going to be a machine through which you could see things at a distance, and that's what you can see in the image here. Um, there we have the Victorian ladies and gentlemen in their in their drawing rooms, and see they're all listening on their telephones, and they're listening to the opera singer, opera singer you know, far away in her in her opera hall, singing on stage. But as you can see, you know, they can see her as well. That's what the telectroscope was going to do. Theatre in the year 2000, it says, this is one of the ways that the Victorians imagined life in the year 2000. So if you can transmit speech, then you can transmit vision. And if you can transmit vision, why can't you transmit pure thought, even, by means of electricity? And there's plenty of speculation at the end of the 19th century about the possibilities of sending thoughts, so to speak, through the ether by means of electricity. So electricity is one of the major ingredients of the Victorian future. Another one is flight. Powered flight is another example of future thinking that you see coming up again and again and again in Victorian discussions of what the future was, was going to look like, how the future would look. And powered flight is a particular preoccupation in the context by the end of the Victorian period of concerns about a growing European war. 
um, magazines, fictional stories of all sorts by the end of the 19th century are all full of imagination, imagining a future war. Um, all the future war stories you see don't always agree as to who the enemy is going to be, for example. Sometimes it's Germany, sometimes it's Russia, sometimes it's France. But everybody agrees that there's going to be a war, and everybody agrees that the key to winning the war is going to be powered flight. Same kind of fictional and factual predictions of what powered flight would deliver. You'd have this underlying assumption that the first nation, not necessarily even the first nation, to conquer the air would essentially be able to hold the rest of the world to ransom. Um, there's even a series of scientific romances written by George Griffiths that imagines an anarchist group being the first to develop powered flight and then using their control of the air to terrorise you know, all of the great powers of Europe who are powerless to stop them because, of course, they don't have that capacity. You know, they don't have the technology to fly through the air. To finish off, it's often interesting, obviously, looking at you know, these kinds of imaginations of the future just you know, to see what they got right and what they got wrong. But far more interesting than that, for a historian at any rate, I think, is you know, rather than thinking about how accurate these Victorian views of the, futures, of the future might have been, is to think instead about what they tell us about the Victorians themselves, what they tell us about the Victorian present. Since very often, you know, when people imagine the future, as I said before, you know, they're making the future up out of bits and pieces of the present. So their imaginations of the future are often very, very revealing, and I think, that, you know, this kind of fascination with power of flight is very revealing about what concerned them about their own present, about what they thought, you know, what their fears and concerns about the present around them were. So thank you for listening.